as above, so below. Welcome to Connecting with Coincidence. I am your host, Bernard Beitman, MD. I'm a psychiatrist and I study meaningful coincidences. And I've written a book called Meaningful Coincidences, How and Why Synchronicity and Serendipity Happen. I also have initiated um, the Coincidence Cafe, which meets every third Saturday of the month at 11 a.m. Eastern time, where we tell each other coincidence stories. If you want to join it, uh, it's getting bigger and more people are getting tuned in to other people's coincidences and finding people that they wouldn't other, otherwise have met. And please subscribe to the channel. It, it trains the algorithm and gets us going. And any comments you make also gets us out there. So please do that. So I will start with uh, a story, and that story I will title Mystical Romance. And as you will see, that the title is somehow related to uh, the story our guest will tell us, but two different outcomes, very, very different outcomes. Jane went to a Grateful Dead concert. She's in her early 30s and took a psychedelic. She met Brian, who was also high on a psychedelic. They seemed to fuse identities. She declared Brian to be her twin flame. And for those of you not familiar with the twin flame, uh, that's the other person in the world with whom you can each fulfill your own destinies. <sighs> Some people do find people like that. And uh, I may have, but that was only for a little while. And there's all kinds of other things out there. But she was concerned and convinced that he, Brian, was her twin flame. Coincidences fueled the fusion between them. Each was a graduate in graduate school studying for a master's degree in social work. Each wanted to be a therapist. And there were many more. She wanted to help him. However, he lived 150 miles away from where she lived. They kept in touch by texting and occasionally had phone conversations. She soon began to sense that he was sending thoughts to her. Sky talking, she called it. She then became paranoid, uh, thinking he was poisoning her somehow. And then she thought her boyfriend was poisoning her somehow. The romance had gone too far, and eventually she's uh, she ended up in a psychiatric ward, unfortunately. Our guest today will tell us a different story. Uh, our, our She is Scarlett Heinbuch, mm -hmm. who uh, has quite an interesting version of a mystical uh, love, uh, as you will see. Um, she's worked in the financial services field for more than 20 years and is internationally known in the area of women's financial health and social norms theory. Uh, that's quite a, she's a quite accomplished woman. Scarlett uh, hadn't realized until she was an adult that she had a childhood near death experience while drowning when she was about age four, as I recall, in which she was out of her body and felt the love and awareness of the universe. It's pretty, that's a pretty thick, heavy hit for a four year old, but uh, she's still here and uh, it influenced very much what she's going to tell us about. Scarlett holds a PhD in public policy and administration from Virginia Commonwealth University and a master's degree in public health from the same place, School of Medicine. She is the author of We Met on the other side. And that's a very good title for what she's going to tell us about. So welcome to Connecting with Coincidence, Scarlett. Glad to see you again. Yeah, it was fun seeing you in person. It's great seeing you this way as well. Oh, thank you, Bernie. I'm absolutely delighted to be here and excited to, to share our story uh, today and, and to comment on the story you just shared. Um, you know, 
dimensional experiences can go both ways, right? Uh, it can go in a way that isn't always a positive outcome because you're dealing in different um, areas of perceptions and influence. Um, I had all those things with David, but a positive outcome. So that's what we'll talk about today. Um, Bernie, did you want to have a specific start point for me to begin the story? You or? bet I do. I want the specific start point that is the specific start point for that cha this chapter or book of your life really you've written about it um okay. so let's let's and thanks for the comment about the different <laughs> th there it is uh i've got one too but you show it you showed it um so hold it up again um we met on the other side <laughs> other side of what well you're going to find out we met on the other side and it's it's quite a story um and Let's go with it. And it, it started when Scarlett's been a fairly, was a successful, is a successful person in financial fields and other areas, as I mentioned. But start with an AA meeting, please, Scarlett. Okay. Thank you, Bernie. I will. And um, in fact, today is the 18th year anniversary of that AA meeting. It was September 22nd, 2005. And I was going to this AA meeting because I had not been in a long time. Um, I was a graduate student at that time, a single mom with two boys with disabilities. Um, I was going to school full time. I was an adjunct um, professor teaching marriage and family relationships course. I had a lot going on. Um, well, I wasn't teaching at the time, but I was the grad student and I was just struggling. And I found that um, I was feeling overwhelmed and depressed and I was drinking too much, I felt. And I was worried about my drinking and I um, said, you know, my way of coping with things is to take care of it. So what I did was, um, and, and let me back up too. I'd grown up with an alcoholic father. Um, so I knew the warning signs and I was like, well, I'm, I think I'm getting in trouble here. So I started going to AA and to this day, I've stayed um, pretty, pretty with it. And I'm just grateful for all the wonderful tools I learned, but I had, because I was busy with school and life and, and barely had gas money to put in my car, I had not been going to meetings, but my um, friends had been telling me about this man who was going to that particular meeting that I had never met and how he had been uh, very sick and ended up in the hospital. And he had been from the West Coast and been in the Virginia area, I guess, about 10 months and been going to that particular meeting as well. Um, and they were saying, well, his um, he, he'd just been really sick. And now um, he was dying with this very rare illness that he couldn't seem to survive. And um, also my sponsor was at that meeting and she was celebrating her 20 years and asked me to come. So I did. And um, I went that night and at that meeting, that was the night I met David's mother and David is obviously my romantic partner. So spoiler alert on that, but David's mother had been called to fly in from San Francisco um, to Richmond, Virginia that morning. And uh, she took an emergency flight out because they told her that David um, to come say goodbye. He was not going to survive. He'd been in the hospital at that point, three and a half weeks uh, finally diagnosed after uh, more than a dozen consults with a very rare form of vasculitis called Wegener's granulomatosis. Um, basically, that means all of his organ systems have been under attack. He was in, um, on respiratory, uh, a respirator to breathe. His lungs had um, just failed. His one lung had collapsed. He had a chest tube. His kidneys had completely failed and worse, granulomas occur. And that had caused scar tissue on the kidneys so that he would, um, they were actually destroyed at that point would not, kidneys don't regenerate. So um, if he even survived at that point, um, he would need uh, dialysis for the rest of his life and he would not be eligible uh, most likely for a transplant because of the devastation of Wegener's, which generally, if you do survive it, um, and many people do today, but most people didn't when it first happened in the seventies or was diagnosed, um, most folks only live eight years. Um, in addition to that, because he was in the unresponsive coma and on the ventilator for so long, he wasn't getting enough oxygen to the brain. So now there was the concern about um, brain injury or, um, and so that was another a large problem. Also, he had cardiac arrhythmia. Uh, so he was in the ICU for cardiac care too, because his heart had was now under attack. Um, he had sepsis 
he had double pneumonia. He had so many things wrong that um, the doctors later told us any one of the things he had could have killed him literally, but the combination at that point was just not survivable. He, um, and he also had blood clots developing. So they gave him heparin for that. And he had an allergic reaction to the heparin to thin the blood. And um, so that's when they called his mother because he just wasn't going to make it. Everything was shut down at that point. And uh, so I met her at the meeting that night and she um, said that she had just left the hospital in Virginia and had signed the funeral directives. And uh, her, there was something about her that just touched my heart. Um, I guess just being a mom and um, her grace and her dignity um, and her, her sense of presence. And she was thanking everybody for the community that they'd given her son who um, was 42 at the time. And me being a mom, you know, you know, we all know if you're a parent, no matter how old your child is, they're always your child. And she was facing the loss of her child. And at the time too, I was on a prayer team at the church I was attending. And um, I also had studied Reiki to help my sons. So it was one of those moments at the end of the meeting, I went up to her and I was going to say how sorry I was for hearing this about her son. I had never met him, but I'd heard such great things about him. And, but what came out of my mouth was, and to this day, I still can't tell you why I said it, but I said, I don't think you should give up hope yet. Now that was not me talking, Bernie. It wasn't um, because those words are not logical. <laughs> so but that's what came out of my mouth and my mind immediately started going with, why did I say that? And she's looking at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> and like, didn't you hear what I just said? And I, I, I told her, I said, and her name is Dee. Dee is passed on now, but back then um, she was my age. So it's very interesting, all the parallels and coincidences. Um, I didn't, you know, so I just didn't know what to say to her at that point. And I explained that I did Reiki um, and that I was on our prayer team at church. I'd be happy to, to just go and be with him, maybe hold his hand, say a prayer if she would like that. I said, I couldn't promise a thing, but just, you know, I would be willing to do so. And that's when she said, well, he's Jewish. And I said, well, I, I totally get that. I am totally respectful of everybody's uh, faith. And this is not a religious thing. I Reiki is not. And, um, you know, if, if you want me to go, I will. And the assumption was if he is still alive tomorrow, which it didn't seem he would be. And if he was, he, she would have to add me to the list of visit. So ultimately that's what happened. He still was alive the next morning. I was at that point teaching the class. So September 23rd is the day I walked into his hospital room and I had never seen anybody burning a, a acute kidney failure. So I didn't realize that their body is swollen. Um, and I couldn't even see what he looked like because he had, you know, the ventilator in his mouth. He had a feeding tube because he'd been unresponsive in the coma for so long. Um, he had the catheter bag, which was bone dry because he wasn't producing any urine. Um, he was just, and he, I couldn't even see what he looked like. And he had the central line. He had all the, the line, you know, IV lines, everything. And the only noise in the rooms were the machines just beeping and keeping him alive at that point. So my mother is. I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to just uh, interrupt for a moment and I uh, uh -huh. apologize for that, but I, I no, think no, this is so, um, compelling there's so many aspects to it the encouragement for you to go to the meeting in there's so many different ways right um so so many different influences but the the, the thing that stands out i think even to you is don't give up hope and right somehow that came out of you and when you look back now where do you think that came from that, that came from my spirit. That came from that connection point when you alluded to the uh, near drowning at four years old, when I was out of my body, I was in that place of love and, and security and, and just, just bliss. And, and, and that connection to that, I call it the other side because for lack of a better term, but it is another dimension. And, and at four years old, you don't have the, the capability to comprehend the, and you don't assess it. You just experience it. So I was out of my body while my physical body was on the bottom of a pool, not breathing. Um, and, you know, and I realized 
later on in life when I've had time to parse out that experience that, you know, it's not about logic. And I just grew up with the understanding that, of course, there's another side of life. Of course, there's consciousness out of the body. Of course, there's no question in my mind and that we are spiritual beings who are embraced in the kind of love that is truly indescribable. And that being back on this earth is, is not that this is a tough place to be. So, but I never, ever had any doubt about uh, consciousness on the other side because I experienced it four years old. So I wasn't, you know, it wasn't suggested to me. This was in 1964. So I'm giving you my age and date. Um, so this is way before NDEs even had a name. So there wasn't anyone telling me to, to suggest this, this is the reality of what I experienced. So I always ex experienced that sense of love and connection to the, that other side. And, and I always trusted the intuition that came from that. I had so many unusual childhood experiences because of that openness of that connection remaining open. So I had conversely, Bernie, you'll appreciate this because I had grown up with all this intuitive nudging and everything out that and these experiences and seeing other beings from other realms, the spirits of people that I knew and loved who had passed on. This was my norm. I didn't know it wasn't normal for others until I got older, but I spent my years in adult and teenage years trying to compensate by developing my logical side to, you know, become analytical and understand analysis and things like that. So I could balance this out. So what I learned was that that intuitive nudge, it's like a, a just, you, you, you know, it, it's a knowing that's what that felt like to me. So the knowing was saying, don't give up hope, but the mind was saying, well, this defies any kind of logic because they've just been told by everybody at this hospital that this man is not going to live. Um, so why would I even say that? It just felt wrong, but it was also a truth that I was experiencing here. And that's so important when people get a feeling of knowing that is not rational. Right. But it still becomes this, I know this is right. It, it, it takes courage to be able to discard or just put aside the rationality to then follow what you intuitively know to be correct. Yes, I, I you know, it, it's hard. Sometimes I've had things that I've intuitively known to be correct, but I couldn't, um, I knew I couldn't do, say it because again, we, you know, it's a wall we live in. There's a hard line between people who function in an intuitive, creative way and those who do not. I have found that there that you can really integrate this in a beautiful way, but it takes courage to be able to 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 look at things logically and and with clear eyes to make sure that it really meets the criteria for something that um, is not mystical. If it's it's truly mystical, I want it to be so. But I'm going to explore. I'm the biggest skeptic there is um, because I want to know for sure. I want to rule out the obvious, the logical. So, but when those things collide. That's when I have to, I have to go with spirit because that's the way it goes. Um, that doesn't exempt me from struggles uh, um, or being a human, uh, obviously, um, because that's how I ended up drinking too much to deal with over life's overwhelming situation. Being, like I said, a single parent at that point in life uh, with two boys with disabilities. Um, my way of coping was to go to school because it was hard to hold a job full time with all of their needs and um, so, and that's why it ended up studying Reiki, uh, to try to help my, my children. Um, so that, that, that was a lot to be dealing with. Um, and we've, we've gone, you've told us about it and there's more to ask about, but I wanted to be able to have our audience recognize in you a person who could know something that seemed quite illogical, quite irrational. Uh, quite unrealistic to be even more clear this guy was dead uh, that's why his mother was there and you say don't give up hope and then you go so you went to see david and you described the, his state but you couldn't even see his face then then tell us what happened well um my mother's a retired nurse and she had always told me that when people in a coma um 
you need to be aware that they might be able to hear you. And um, so she always told me to speak to them like they're awake, anybody who is unconscious like that. And he was my first person I'd ever seen in coma, but I remembered that. So I introduced myself. I told him my name. I told him why I was there because we had not met. And so I thought, well, now he's meeting me. And I told him I was there because I'd met his mother the night before and that a lot of people loved him and cared about him and um, really sad that he was in this situation and, um, and that I had come to do some healing work with him if he would like, and, and I would be happy to pray with him if he would like. Um, and I told him that I needed his permission. Now, how are you going to get permission from someone who's unconscious and unresponsive? Well, that's where the spiritual level came in. I told him, I'm just going to stand here and wait this is your journey, your choice. And it's very empowering. And this is something in healing people. It's their choice, um, whether to receive, I'm merely a facilitator, but it was his choice, whether he even wanted me to work with him or not. And I had to respect that I was just showing up. So I stood there for a moment and I felt a puff of air. And that, that was my spiritual recognition because there's nowhere, nowhere that the air would have come that, um, that it was okay to work with him. So I took his hand, um, and careful not to dislodge the pulse oximeter or the IV lines very, very gingerly and, um, and said an opening prayer. And I used, I spoke out loud and I just gave thanks to the creator of all that is, um, for this time together, giving thanks for David, um, and giving thanks for his healing under, the most sacred and holy highest and best energies in this dimension and any other. Now I never realized when I said those exact words that that would open the door to other things. But when I had that connection with David and just holding his hand, I felt um, a sense of just overwhelming um, sorrow and I could feel his feelings. And I was like, Oh my gosh, you know, he's, he's really struggling in the spiritual realm. Um, and I didn't feel he was even in his body. We were connecting somewhere, but his, you know, so when I did that and I went, I, I told him out loud, I said, look, you do have a choice and whatever you choose to do is okay. If you want to go, but go in peace, know that you're absolutely loved, that you are absolutely forgiven. There's nothing that you aren't loved. You know, it's the love of, of the, that energy is so huge. There's nothing you can do that to change that. But if you want to stick around, if you feel you have unfinished business, then I will offer to be here and help you through it. So again, your choice. So I did my Reiki for about 15, 20 minutes. I did not feel any real energy from his body. And I thought, well, he, he's probably going to go. And um, as I was getting ready to leave, I did a closing prayer thinking again for the time. And at that point, I was getting ready to take my hand away and leave. And that's when I, my hand was stuck to his hand. He had no grip. So he wasn't grabbing my hand, but I couldn't pull my hand away without a significant jerk away. And I realized that his spirit was reaching out and back. And that's when I was startled by it. But I realized that he, he was trying to hang on. So I told him if he decided to stick around and he would be here tomorrow, then I would come back and I would keep coming back until he pulled through if he would like that. So I went home, I fell into a nap. I was so exhausted. <laughs> I didn't even realize the energy it had taken. So I could go on with this, but this is why I wrote the book because so much happened in the 12 day period. I worked with Tim Bernie. So I want to kind of summarize that for folks and hit the yes. highlight. Yes. I think the, uh, yes, I think that's a good idea because you've, You've told the story many times as well as written it uh, in the book um, we met on the other side. And the, the, the key summary I th hope you would do here is, is w this meeting on the other side, because my vision of that is two spirits uh, yammering with each other. It's like, uh, hey, David, hey, Scarlett, what's happening? Uh, I mean, there was a little bit more profoundness to that, to that but my, the idea of your spirits communicating just kind of regularly, it seemed, uh, I think is an important part of this whole story. Uh, so if you could 
tell us about communicating with David while his body is deteriorating, apparently, and you're there with him for 12 days and we're, you're communicating. And that's so important. I think people can do that with each other without having one body not working very well. I think that kind of communication at a spiritual level can happen. And so that's why I'm most interested in this, your description of how that went and, and give us a sense for that communication with David. And and to level set, um, yes, he he was a multi system organ failure, so his body definitely was just being kept alive by the machines at that point. Um, when after that first night with David, I felt his presence in my room. So we had established some sort of link, and I felt things around him. I was like, "Why am I feeling a sense like I owe him something that I need to help him?" It's even when I, again, logically, it didn't make sense. I didn't have the time nor the money to even go to the hospital, but I felt my spirit got a call. That's the best way I can put it, and I was supposed to be there. Uh, about the fourth day in, he still survived. He started to have a tiny bit of urine production, which was a positive sign. He was still alive. He was hanging in there. Um, the fourth day I went in to work with him after class and I took his hand and I opened every day with the, the same prayer um, and the same process to establish contact with the, the physical contact and with the hand and um, and say the prayer and do the Reiki treatment. And could, then you, leave. could you tell us the prayer? Yeah, the prayer was um, pretty much giving thanks to um, to the creator of all that is for his healing, for all healing of everything, his body, his mind, his spirit, every organ, every system within his body, um, everything that needed healing to be restored to complete, complete wholeness, renewed, regenerated, and healed. Um, so his kidneys, his, his, um, his lungs, his brain, his, 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 vascular system, everything, just everything. I just give, I called out each system and gave thanks for, for the healing that was taking place. Again, use, asking only for the highest and best, most sacred and holy energies in this dimension and any other under the creative hand of the holy, holiest spirit of energy. Thank so, you. thank you. So, um, so that's what I did because again, having worked in other dimensions and felt it, I know there's not always positive energy there, Bernie, there isn't. So I don't want anything to do with that. I want only the best. So that's what I was calling in. Um, and again, he was in a Catholic hospital and he's a Jewish man in a Catholic hospital. There's the ascended cross behind right in front of his bed. And so I'm trying to be mindful of all these spiritual energies and being grateful for all of them, you know, that they're all just there. So when I took his hand that day, I had finished the prayer, went to a silence, and then I'm out of my body. I'm standing at this cot in one moment, and the next I'm in another place. I'm in that place of love and healing and peace, like that you know that is indescribable, similar to the place I was when I had my own near-death experience. But this was what was different. Um, I was in a light. Uh, I call it like particles of light. It just felt like millions, billions, who knows? It felt like I call it liquid love. But there's nothing you can't describe the textures because it's not wet, but it, it it's just there's no words in our human way to describe it. But I was embraced in this kind of love and and light. And it's not a tunnel. And um, because he was hovering out of his body, I was out of my body and he was he was pre tunnel, but I'm meeting him before he's going. And I know that he is hovering out of his body, which I've later learned is not unusual for people in a coma. Um, he, there, he's like in a prolonged near-death experience because he's dying and um, and he can unplug his tether at any point and go. So he was hovering and he was ready to go. And that's when my spiritual eyes opened and I was aware that I was holding the hand of this other spirit. And now I realized that 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 person or that energy was David. And I was there in that spiritual energy, in that realm, in the near death space, meeting this man out of his body who's getting ready to go. 
And there I am with him. And then my soul recognized him. And I recognized that I had always known him in this forever place of love and that I loved him, but not in the way that we talk about love on earth. This was like an every kind of love. It was just so huge. There aren't any words to describe it. It's not your typical romantic boy, girl love. It's just the universal as agape type of love. It was just, I've, my soul knew I've always known and loved this man. I've known him forever since time. And, and, and the love was so huge. There wasn't like we were talking, there was no verbal communication. It was just a download of information. I knew his feelings and knew his life. I knew he was sensing mine. I knew he knew everything about me too. And we just, there was a communion of souls. It's the best way I can describe it. And the energy work we've been doing somehow, our energies had combined in a way that we were still separate discrete beings, but we were somehow connected in a larger way. So I called it a communion of souls at that point. And I recognized that this was for, you know, my soulmate, twin soul, whatever name you want to call it, there, you can call it whatever. But I just knew that this was my person from time. And I didn't know what was going to happen next. But what he taught me in that loving encounter was whatever is best for his spirit at this point in his journey is what love would be. And if that meant that his body was too devastated for him to come back to, and he didn't want to have that experience, if his if it meant that he needed to go, then love would want that. Love this kind of love was not selfish. This love wanted what was absolutely best for the other, and that was so stunning to to process and feel that kind of love, that unselfish that just absolute love of another being to the point that whatever was best for them, even if it wasn't best for me, because I, you know, we're super, we're selfish beings, right? We want what we want, but I, I, that was what was revealed to me is how you love another being in, in this dimension. And then I'm plopped back in my body. And, and that's how you love another being. That's how you love another being is to want what is best for them with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your might and with all of your mind. And it's hard to do that in this dimension because yes. we run these movies of the future where we have the other person play a role in it that we want them to be in. Mm -hmm. and, and when you came back, to your body those movies are still tending to run uh, about what you want even though you've had this beautiful it brings tears to my eyes to feel the love that you were feeling for david and still do um the, the love but you became it became new to you and it's kind yes. of new to it's kind of new to me these days too so it's so that's why it partly touches me to feel that the most important thing is how she wants what she wants, what's best for her. And to be able to facilitate that to happen is the best kind of love, the ideal kind of love. And you discover that on the spiritual plane. And I just love hearing how that you didn't talk. I mean, it was, I didn't mean to, say yeah. you were but in a way you were i mean to me it's like uh it, yeah you're not using words and i say yapping about there but because i like to bring it to what we're like here because actually you were communicating or communing yes. <laughs> and i i like to make it not as like mystical because i think it's a reality it's part of being alive but that you are helping us see that we can communicate with the spirits the spirit of a loved one at a distance without necessarily having words going between us but we mm -hmm. still can communicate in the clearest most loving and most and the deepest way of communing which is knowing the other person really well while also keeping your own individuality mm -hmm. yes thank you that that's a beautiful way to to uh, to describe it what happened and then i'm back in my body holding his hand 
stunned at what happened because I'm still a human being. And now I've just been revealed that this this call to me, this is my soulmate, <laughs> my this half what? dead man who, who may not even live. Because I'm human too. I'm like, oh, what? I, I mean, in that moment, you know, in that loving place, you know, the, the thing about it is it's I call it the place of absolute truth, Bernie, because there's no there, you can't hide anything in that space. There are yeah. no barriers. There's there's um well, I mean, there's there's a sense of self, right, of our own unique spiritual spark, but there's also just, there's no guile. There's nothing that's deceitful in the space where I am in that high grace state because, um, so it's just absolute truth and, and sharing. And, but when we're human, we're back in this world where everything is clouded with, with stuff. Plus I didn't even know the man. I didn't even know him in this life. So how could, how could, I and mean, we hadn't even met in reality. He wasn't awake. I don't call that a meeting, but that's where I meet the love of my life in that suspended pre-death before he goes state. And I learned the most profound lessons of love from him, from this complete stranger to me in this life, in that moment about being loving and not being selfish. And, and I thought, well, is that it? It, did he just come to teach me this lesson um, so that as I go on in my life and he goes on to the spiritual realms that I've learned a deeper understanding of what real love is about? Um, is that it? And yet I'm still human because I'm now I'm feeling a sense of loss and sorrow because I want to experience more of it. You know, um, I want to know what this is like in this reality and I might not have that opportunity. So I had to accept that, um, you know, and so there it was. So he was still unconscious, still unresponsive. And I'm standing there just stunned by everything. Again, my mind could not even begin to really process what had happened. I was just still experiential, but I went ahead and did the, the Reiki work with him and went home, not knowing what was going to happen. And so that was the, the meeting on the other, uh, on the other side. Now we had another very unusual experience. Um, his kidneys, as I mentioned several days after that, um, his kidneys were still in failure. He was hanging on, obviously he was surviving. He was showing some signs of trying to recover, but, um, it was still up and down, up and down. Um, so when I went into work with him, they were saying, you know, his kidneys are really, really just not going to recover. And uh, he had to have a dialysis treatment that day as well. And he'd been getting them. Um, so at that point, the nurses were treating me very respectfully because they could see that he was hanging on despite the odds. Um, and that night I was in my room and because I'd had that out of body experience when I was four Bernie, I was able to be out of my body and have, um, you know, experiences having astral floating around and seeing things. And that was just organically happening. I had to learn how to manage that. But that night I was in bed and I was saying my prayers and getting ready to go to sleep. And then my mind shifted and we call this remote viewing. Um, I didn't know, you know, really hadn't thought about it that way, but I was in his room and I was experiencing something different. I had been praying about specifically his kidneys at that point. And I saw in his room, him being surrounded by these four very tall light beings, one at each end, uh, one at the each end and two on the side. Um, they looked like a medical team. They looked human to me, except that they were very tall uh, with very sharp features. Um, and they appeared in my eyes to be bluish in color. And I thought, well, that's unusual. Um, so I'm seeing them working on David and it looks like I see um, a set of kidneys kind of holographically hovering over his body and that they basically are just sinking into his body and replacing or healing the ones that are there, restoring them to wholeness. So I think, well, maybe I'm just having kind of a lucid dream or I'm falling asleep because I've not had any experience with that, with beings from, um, that appear a different color like that, or exceptionally taller, those sorts of features. So, and then I think, well, I'm just 
again, having some sort of weird experience with this or perception, but the, I call them the lead doctor because I look, feel like they were a healing team and looks up and nods their head. Like they see me and I'm like, Oh, they're seeing my spirit out of my body in this dimension because they're in a different dimension. And here they are in this man's room replacing his kidneys. Well, I recognize that we're having also a connection. Then again, I'm back in bed and I'm like wondering, okay, am I, what's going on here? So um, the next morning I went to the hospital and his kidneys began to ramp up and function. And I'd known to take my tuning forks to kind of calibrate the energy. I used a lot of tools, tuning forks, aromatherapy, um, oil, ses organic sesame oil on the feet to kind of help with essential fatty acids, but also to hit some uh, um, acupressure points. So I was doing a lot of different healing modalities with him. Um, so I, I worked on um, his kidneys specifically, and the nephrologist was called in and they said, something's going on here. And uh, they started to call him Miracle Boy. And they said that his uh, kidneys were starting to heal. And they said, well, that's just not possible because of the damage and the scar tissue from the granulomas. Um, so they're all perplexed. And then each day that goes by, the nephrologist kept coming in and the, the functioning exponentially increased. David also during that time woke up and returned to consciousness. Um, and within a week, his kidneys were back to full functioning, normal and totally healed. They said, this is just not possible. You know, this is, you know, doesn't make it, it's just not possible. And that's why they call him miracle boy. So, um, all this is documented in his medical records, um, because it is what it is. It's what happened. So when David woke up and we met in real life, after that, having all these unusual experiences of meeting on the other side, seeing this, this healing team replace his kidneys. But again, none of this is logical or rational or even possible, but this is what happened. Um, and of course, my mind's going questioning everything. What, how is this possible? Am I, how am I, why would I perceive these beings as blue? What is there some significance there? What does that mean? But in the end, the results spoke for themselves his kidneys healed. And there is no medical explanation for how that happened. Also, when he opened his eyes, we had never met. And then we had to meet in person. Well, that was awkward because he's like, well, you know, later he told me, he said, um, but first I'm like, I'm introducing myself and telling you why I'm there. And um, here I'm the love of my life. But now it's like, oh, hi, I'm, I'm Scarlett. Nice to meet you. <laughs> I know everything about you, but, <laughs> um, but, and, and um, later he told me, he said, when he opened his eyes, he was also confused because he'd been in the, you know, in there for a month at that point, over a month and 40 days. And uh, he said he went in, it was still summer and now it was fall and uh, the seasons had changed. He didn't even know really what had happened, except that he knew when he opened his eyes, he said he knew everything about me. He knew my struggles. He, he uh, knew he was going to marry me but he didn't even know my name. <laughs> I said, well, I said, we both had a big tall order of that one. And uh, because he had the spiritual recall of everything, but because of all the medications and the coma state, he didn't just wasn't there in the conscious recall, but he knew on the spiritual level what had happened. And um, so, you know, anyway, I continued to work with him. He well, went out of the hospital. Let's 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 talk about that for just a minute because Ooh, <laughs> yeah, a I, it's a lot already. It's a lot already, and so we'll take a little breather for Scarlet. But the image, the image of David's eyes opening, and you're there, and you haven't met on this physical plane yet. This is when you're meeting with each other, right. and yet. <laughs> You know, he knows a lot about you and you know a lot about him from your communicate from your communions. And he, there's still a startling aspect to that for each of you, that you meet each other in this more rational, logical, supposed world that we think we're living in. And that 
that was that moment is something that I'm going to ask you to to tell us more about because that was such a transformative part of all this story of yours. Well, just meeting in the moment somebody that your soul knows on another dimension and space and time. It is hard to describe because on one hand, he's a familiar stranger. He's a complete stranger to me. I didn't even know what his voice sounded like. And um, I mean, I didn't even know what his eye color was. I didn't know. I mean, so I'm seeing him really for the first time, um, hearing his voice, which was still raspy from the, the tubes. Um, and that took a long time to get back. But, um, and I was like, well, it's one thing to love a spiritual person, but who is he as a human being? Are we going to have anything in common? I couldn't imagine that we would. I mean, we're totally different spirit face, complete different walks of life. He was in the financial services field. I was moving on in public policy and help public health and these sorts of things. Um, you know, I didn't know anything about what he was like, except I knew we had a common denominator in terms of AA that we were both on path of recovery, that we had embraced, um, you know, working toward our solving our, our problems in life in a more holistic and healthier way, um, you know, that we both faced challenges that were pretty daunting. But um, so that's all I really knew about him. Um, so so I, it's, a, it's a bit of a shock to to know that you love this person. Yes, and to I don't know, even know. <laughs> and you don't know this person, and right? It, and so there's this getting to know you part of this, which is, as you said, is awkward. It's awkward, awkward. It's like, well, well, you know, I could love him, but what do I even like him? I mean, is you, someone? What he could he be? My friend? Would he be someone I'd want to hang out with? Was he open mind? What kind of person was he? Um, so. And, and, and just just to answer that, sorry to interrupt, but that sorry even to answer those crucial questions, would you even like him? Would he even like you? Is exactly. part of it. Is part of it. Now that's these are these are part of living in relationships in this environment, and that's scary and confusing to have such in strong feelings for him and him for you and knowing that he has them for you and yet you've got this these questions you've got these questions and uh, how did you how did you manage that well i mean i had really given up on relationships at that point in my life and i had also thought too there's nobody who's going to want to take on a single mom with two kids with disabilities um and all that and um teenagers at that point it was like that oh, it, it's just not going to happen and um uh, so i had just given up and plus remember too bernie this wasn't a romantic feeling this was just an incredible love you know that so i didn't know what was going to happen but i did know i thought well maybe he came back and maybe he we we're going to do healing work together because he had a miracle healing this is this is pretty stunning He's had a near-death experience. He's on the road to recovery. So there's a lot of commonalities and maybe we would do something to uplift humanity from this experience. Um, so he flew out to the West Coast after he got out to the hospital to go visit his mother. Um, I didn't know anything about him at the time, but he was still married at the time. And he got out to the West Coast and the and he was given divorce papers because the marriage had, had been in um in rough shape, I guess, for many years and had um not turned around and this experience didn't help it. It sometimes an experience like that can help people bring them together, but this did not happen. So when he came back to the Virginia, and I I had prayed for him to go and I prayed for his marriage to be healed because in my mind, again, that's what love wants. Love wants things to heal. And, um, and that's what I thought would be the best thing for him was for him to heal this marriage and, and go on live it out his life. And that was, that would be the way it had to be, but that's not what happened. And that was not his decision. I mean, it was made for him. And, uh, so when he came back to Virginia, um, and said that he, he had divorce papers and was going to move forward and, um, heal. And I said, okay, well, you know, 
that was kind of it. We just started. And then he had another relapse where he ended up in the hospital again with double pneumonia and the treatment for Wagner's at that time were very strong immunosuppressants that had actually done too much of a job. So he nearly died again. And that's when I went back to the hospital to work with him again. And that's when we recognized that we uh, really loved each other in, in the human realm. How did so, you, how did you recognize that? Well, we had um, in between, you know, we had, we had, after he'd gotten back, we had gone to uh, the beach because he said the water soothed him. We went to Norfolk and he was healing. And I was really sick at that point, but we just realized we enjoyed, we loved being together, that we knew that there was a sense of um, import, sense of destiny here. This was beyond, every single thing was coincidental, how we met, all of it, Um and he recognized that he loved me and I recognized that I loved him, but he was still incredibly sick. He was still very weak. You don't come out of something like that and you just bounce off. He still had to have a cane to walk. He was still trying to regain his breathing. Um, kidneys were great, but the breathing and every functionality, fortunately, there was no brain injury. Uh, that was another kind of miracle because that was also expected. Um so we just recognized that we loved each other. And then, then he went back into the hospital and then he was close to going to die again. And I thought, is this it again? You learn just to find this kind of love and now he's going to go for sure. And now that's it. I mean, I was feeling kind of angry because I'm human, right? I'm feeling cheated. It's like, oh my gosh, to finally find this love and then no, it's gone. Um, but he also healed from that. And, um, so that was back in November and Thanksgiving. And after that, we got, we stayed together and, and we just stayed together. That was it. We were married in June of 2006 and we've been married over 17 years. And, and tomorrow is the 18th year anniversary of the day I walked into his hospital room. So and here we are. <laughs> and here we are. And we're going to have to end in a little bit so you can get going yeah. to your next meeting. Thank you. I'm you're welcome. I'm still I'm I'm still caught up with uh how you how you you came to like him. I mean, that was the big question. Well, he's a great guy. All the people who cared about him liked him so much are right. He's truly a great guy. He's got a wonderful sense of humor. Um, you'll appreciate this. We have the picture of the rabbi hanging on the wall, and we ended up getting the ascended cross. Um that was very similar to the one at the hospital. So we have them together and we have joke. We have, we have a great sense of humor. I said, well, I have these Jewish fellows hanging around the rabbi. There's the Yeshua. <laughs> there's you. <laughs> I said, so we just, um, you know, we, we approach our, our relationship from that spiritual base. Um, we both work in financial services. We um, really love it. I mean, we do live in this world economy. We've learned how to live in this world, but also to understand that, that we have a sacred bond. I'm not going to say that everything is perfect. We're, we're human. We have um, struggles just like everybody. Um, we have moments where like, <sighs> pick up your socks already. <laughs> um, we're just human, but we have, we know that we're together because of a miracle that brought us together. And um, we do love each other very much. And he has taught me so much about um, love and patience in this domain. And he was a wonderful and it is a wonderful stepdad to my boys who love him very much. Um, and I ended up with two bonus daughters from him because I always wanted girls and never had them. So we ended up blending our lives and our families in ways that, um, you know, it, it's just truly been a miracle. So when I look at this from the pit step from 18 years back, and I just remember how tentative and, and how powerful everything was that happened that that time frame 18 years ago and where we are today, I still pinch myself, Bernie. I still pinch myself because in recovery, we know it's a one day at a time deal and, and it is, but 18 years on, it's still a one day at a time deal, but I count myself very, very um, blessed to have had this experience. And David and I both know if we're taken today or tomorrow, we know where we're going and we know we'll meet up again. And we know that, and that, that brings us peace um, that we, and for whatever we reason, we got to have this time together on, on this earth journey to walk it together for these past 18 years. 
And um, it has been such such a humbling experience um, to learn about love and and in the human way that we have. And it's I'm just grateful. But that's yes. that's why I wrote the book, Bernie. Um, you know, because so many things happened, and and I just can't even begin to to say everything that happened. Thank you for holding that up. But but that's why. And I included the prayers. I included resources to help people. I wrote the book for it to be helpful, um, because I think that the work that happened and what happened with David. I think we can do more in the medical settings to help people using Reiki and the power of the spoken word. And I don't even think you have to have an NDE. Now, David and I had an unusual love story, but I think that we can do more to help heal people in catastrophic situations with respect to what they want. But again, so I'm trying to look at the next steps in my life and how I can take this gift I have been given and help others, um, perhaps in the clinical settings with, with, implementing more and more Reiki and energy um, modalities combined with, you know, power of the spoken word. Well, you're, you're, I'm a doctor and you're focusing on, on healing, which is part <laughs> of what I'm supposed to do. <clears throat> yeah. But what I'm focusing on is the love that you dis discovered um, yeah. that, and that this is the most soul matey thing I've ever heard myself. Oh. And, Thank probably you. other people in the in the detail of it and the experience of it at the uh, at another dimension so mm -hmm. you unlike the story i began with you found your soulmate and yes. the two of you were able to know that in that other dimension yes. that nde pre-nde pre-nde dimension and then be able to realize it on this plane and the healing was extremely was extremely necessary but for the rest of us the healing methods you talk about are important are very important and trying to bring to m the medical profession but the love that you experienced is yet for me just as important yes it is. And, and um, like I said, I, I am humbled by it. I know we don't all get to be with our soulmates and I don't know how this happened for me, except that it did. And I'm grateful. Um, but that's what I want people to understand more that the love that surrounds us in, in those other dimensions, Bernie, it is so enormous. And we are always loved that way. If we can just embrace it. And that sometimes even when we don't have the personal one-to-one -one experience on an extended basis, and that was the thing. I was afraid David would die and I would never have to have be able to have that. And this man told me at the butcher at the the local grocery store was a very spiritual man. I was explaining that. And he said, Scarlett, if you even got to experience for one day that kind of love, that's more than most people get in a lifetime. So be grateful. It's not up to you. And I was like, oh, he's right. And that's when I realized we all can experience love. If we even experience it for a second, Bernie, then that the ripple effect of a lifetime of love, just being able to experience it at all is the gift. We don't get to decide how long we get it ever. It's not up to us. Let's end here with that loving comment, Scarlett. Thank you very, very much for being with me today. Thank you, Bernie. Thank you for having me. This psychosphere is our mental atmosphere, like a hologram of cosmic consciousness.